Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you, say. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. We're in the 12th chapter of the great book of Matthew. And we're going to pick it up in about verse 46 here in a moment. Christ has just um, cleansed or told us how to cleanse someone that has an evil spirit. That once you cast out the spirit, then place Christ in. Do not leave them empty or the evil spirit will return. And um, it, it, it for a fact happens that way. But as long as you have Christ and the Holy Spirit in you, then an evil spirit can't bother you. You have power over them. And you need to have them so afraid of you, they'll run when you walk into a room. Okay, having said that, uh, chapter 12, verse 46, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, um, While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. They were a little bit concerned because of all the talk that was going around, and and they loved him. Then, but they, because there was such a multitude and he had become so famous, forty-seven. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. They want to talk to you. Verse forty-eight. And he answered and he said unto him that told him. Who is my mother? Question. And who are my brethren? Question. Now, the Lord always loved his mother. Don't ever think for a minute he's putting her down. But he's speaking in a spiritual sense that we're all one family. And Father, Almighty God is be the Father of all. Okay. And um, that makes it um, family, spiritually speaking. But who is your spiritual family? Well, listen and find out. Verse 49, And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. How does that come to be? 50, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. In other words, we are a spiritual family and we have one Father in, in, um, indeed. Now, if you're not real careful, you can sure read over something. If you're, and what did it say there, really, that if you love the Lord, well, you're, you're in? That's not what it said. If you love the Lord, you're his brother. No, that's not what it said. Let's go back and check it out. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven. You have to do His will or you're not part of that family. It, it is written in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 that it is God's will that all come to repentance. Father wants you to really repent and come into the letter that He's written to you, the Word of God, to absorb it and to be a doer of it. That, that takes, that takes uh, work in belief and study and doing on your part to be, a, to be blessed and to be a member of that. Too many people have listened to soothsayers who will say, you don't have to do anything. God will do it all for you. That's not true. That's, that's why the little promises, you've got to know them, you've got to claim them. And that word, if, it seems like people like to leave that little word out. If you do this or if you do that, uh, they, they just read right over that. So you have to do the will of our Heavenly Father to be a family member. That, that becomes very important in serving the living God if you want His blessings. If you do not do His will, 
And, and mainly his will, number one, this is why you hear me hammer so much on God wants your love. He, want, he wants you to love him more than anything else you could do. That's a good start. And when you truly love him and speak to him, comfort him as he comforts you, and then add on to that a doer and of his will, then you can stand by to receive. Uh, why? Because you're family. You are the family. You're part of it. And um, it's a wonderful thing to know who your heavenly father is, your spiritual father. It's almighty God. It's Yahweh. And he loves his children. He cares for his children. If you're in his will, and if you're a doer of his will, what he would have you do. Well, how do I know what he wants me to do? That's why you work in his word to find his will. Then comes the blessings. Chapter 13, verse 1. The same day when went Jesus out of the house, and he sat by the seaside. Verse 2, And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. This has been found for what it's worth in later years, this particular spot. And, and when you're in a little ship pulled off away from the shore, it provides a natural amphitheater whereby m multitudes could hear him speak because it makes a natural amphitheater and uh, how precious it is to, to hear his voice. Verse 3, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. This chapter 13 in this great book of Matthew is one of the most important chapters in God's Word that you should understand. If you want His blessings, if you want to be pleasing to Him, if you want to understand His Word. The first thing to understand is to understand the sower. What we're talking about here is broadcasting. This is, broadcasting is what the way you plant we would even to this day, small um, seed such as, let's say, clover um, for a small place, patch, or, um, or turnips or something of that nature that you can sow with broadcast. A man, a grown, an adult man can usually, you have a bag with the seed in it, usually around your neck or on a hip, and you can take a handful of seed and you can sow about 30 feet in either direction, which is quite a swath, as we would call it, okay, in sowing seed, and that's broadcasting. Now, coming out the gate, get it straight in your mind, the seed is the Word of God. And you can see, in a sense, the analogy that right now we're broadcasting. We're broadcasting to the world. That's quite a swath. But the word will go out, that is the seed. And that word will fall on many places. Christ explains now how those places um, uh, adhere and do the will of God. So there you have the broadcast sower. That's what he's doing. Verse four to continue. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside and the fowls came and devoured them up. The wayside was the path, okay? It was a beaten path like you would have a sidewalk today or even a street. In sandals and footprints, they pack that soil down, the, the, the terra firma. They pack it down until no seed could take root through that, okay? And, and naturally, it's not going to take root. And when you're broadcasting, that you cannot control where each little seed goes. So some of it's going to fall in the wrong place any more than in teaching God's Word, the true seed. Um, you cannot expect 100% germination of the truth sprouting forth. Uh, verse 5, Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, 
and forthwith they sprung up, I mean, they, they sprouted and came right on up because they had no depthness of earth, deepness of earth. They, they couldn't have a root system and a plant must have a root system to grow. Verse six, and when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And, and so it is with some people that hear God's word. When the sun comes up and men scorch them a little bit for holding the truth, they cast it away, don't want any part of that. Seven, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Now, the thorn you know, bramble bush is usually um, um, an analogy towards Satan, okay? <clears throat> As a matter of fact, um, the trees and vines at one time would want to fix themselves a king. And nobody wanted to be that king. And finally the bramble bush, thorn bush said, hey, uh, you got your man. I'll be your king. But if I'm going to be your king, you've got to come and worship under my shadow. And you see, there's just one problem. The bramble bush or thorn bush doesn't make a shadow. Therefore, it's deception coming out the gate. So, <clears throat> uh, there you got it. No shadow, no uh, depth, eight. And another fell into a good ground and brought forth fruit, some in hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. You know, it doesn't matter. That's good soil. And God expects the, the harvest to be whatever the gift is he gives man or woman or child. And from a, a one he gives much, he expects much. So, but um, the reward is still the same for the hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold. It's completeness. It's what God expects of that individual. And, uh, and so it is that that crop would produce. Verse 9, listen carefully. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And, and this means... If you can understand the truth, and if you have ears to hear the Word of God, then certainly He expects you to understand the simplicity by utilizing the analogy which He has put forth of the sower and seed being the Word of God, that you could understand people's minds also as to how uh, Word is received. Now. Uh, naturally, coming out the gate, let me say, never think that you're going to have 100% hear your word when you're sowing the seed, the word of God. They're not going to. Um, and God has reasons for it. We'll see if we can get into it. Verse 10, and the disciples came and they said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Why don't you just lay it out there like it is? Verse 11, And he answered and he said unto them, Because, here's your answer, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. In other words, it is important that you absorb that. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are given to those that will be a doer, that will receive the blessings of God, that will act upon it, and, and will plant seeds, will be a sower of that seed. Verse 12, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. In other words, if, if, you, if God gives you a truth and you don't share it, he's not going to give you anything else. So when, when, when he gives you a seed to plant, plant it. That doesn't mean you've got to get out on a street corner and preach or anything. If God gives you a truth, sooner or later somebody's going to ask you a question and you should share it. And then God will give you more. But uh, if you hide it under a bushel, your light, you're not going to produce anything. It is God's time and God's place. And 
I, I want you to know that one little seed is as important to our Heavenly Father as the, the whole load. So when you plant one little seed, it can be very important. Don't ever sell yourself short. If you convert or, or pass one truth along, that's beautiful, that's wonderful. That's the way God's mystery works. Verse 13, therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. They, they cannot understand anything spiritual, and, and so it is. You know, in the fourth chapter of, I believe it is Mark, God said, you either understand this parable of the sower, or you won't understand any of my parables. And that's really kind of true of how it is because the tares will be coming along in a moment. That's part of the sowing. And if you don't understand that part, really you are hard pressed to understand any parable because this particular chapter, as I said, becomes very important because it gives you the overall view. It identifies your opposition, which puts you on guard. But many people say, you can see, you can see um, um, the sun come up every morning, you can see it go down at night, you can see the stars at night, but you don't see God's truth. And hearing, you can hear all kinds of things, but someone could teach God's word directly into your ear and it would, go, it would be soundless because you wouldn't understand it. That's what he's saying. And uh, God would say, there are some I don't want to understand at this time. It's to protect them probably against committing the unpardonable sin. Verse 14, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Let's just say Isaiah, which saith, by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. And of course, he's talking about um, Isaiah chapter six, verse nine. And so it is that in Isaiah six, nine, you would, you would have the, the lesson on what brought this forth and, and it would make a nice home study for you on your own. You can start about verse eight if you want. Who, wants to, who can I send? Who will hear? You will, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Verse 15. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. That's to say they're spiritual eyes. Many times you have to close your physical eyes to open your spiritual eyes to communicate with Almighty God, to be able to see the spiritual. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, that's their mind, and should be converted, and I should heal them. And, um, and, and you know, Hebrews chapter five, verse 11, makes it very clear. He says, you, you, you're not even ready to come out of the milk, some of you. So I can't teach you the truth because you don't have ears to hear or eyes to see. And, and uh, so it is. Uh, makes a good side study for you to think about. Uh, you have to get into the depth of God's Word, and it isn't deep, it's simple. It's common sense in knowing and understanding His Word. And again, He's not going to convert somebody to come into the election or even the free will part that will witness when they would deny the Holy Spirit and it could do much harm. That's why he has the millennium, is to teach those that are just incapable of hearing or doing in the flesh. Uh, that, a lot of people may, be, may resent that statement. It's a fact, verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, God's elect, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. 17. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those sights, things, which you see, 
and have not seen them. And you might, that trans, you'll notice that them is in italics. You can translate that him, seeing him, which is to say Christ. And to hear those things, or to hear him, Christ, which you hear and have not heard him instead of them. And, and so it is. Many of the prophets, they wanted to live in your generation when all this was going down. How fortunate you are to live in this generation whereby you see the parable of the fig tree as it comes forth and you see God's word unfolding before you and you know that the false one is coming soon and you must make that stand. That's why some, as it is written in Romans 11, why they're not going to see, they're, they have the spirit of stupor or slumber upon them, basically for God's love, their own protection. Verse 18, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. I'm going to explain it to you. Verse 19, When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, that's the seed, is the word of the king, that's the king and his dominion, that's Christ and all the universe and the world, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart, this is he which received the seed by the wayside. I mean, the wicked one, what? It's the ways of the world and Satan. The controversy is between Satan and Almighty God. They, they can't handle the word, so they're deceived by the wicked one. When, when it says that um, um, he uh, takes them away, he catches the way, that one which is uh, sown, um, he catches them away with what? Well, he's going to promise them he's going to fly them away. And many of them are going to believe it because they don't know, in as much as they haven't studied the sixth, the, the book of Revelation, to know that at the sixth trump, the Antichrist comes. The true Christ doesn't come until the seventh. So they're harvested out of season. And he does catch them away, right, real quick. Christ is returning here to set up a kingdom, not to catch somebody away. Verse 20. But he that received the seed in, into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and a noun. A noun means immediately, with joy, receiveth it. I've got it. I've got the truth. I see it. I know it. But remember, it's, it's in a stony place. It can't take root. And there it sits. But you, you've saw, you have observed people like that where you planted seeds of the truth and they were so excited. They had it right down, I mean, to the wire. Then what happens? Verse 21. Yet hath he not root in himself. There's no depth. But dureth, dureth, but dureth for a while. He endures for a little bit. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, because of what? Because of the word, his belief, by and by, that's the same word as a noun, it means instantly, he is offended. He'll drop it. Boy, can't stand that pressure. Why? Well, because he has no depth. He does not, I mean, what we're dealing with is eternal life. You know, this flesh age is just for a little while. But believing in our Heavenly Father is forever, both in the earth age in the beginning and that that comes. The whole, I mean, the whole thing evolves within that because those that will not listen and adhere, you're not going to be there. This is going to cull you right out if you're not really true and, and you let the least little bit of tribulation of the world shake you, then you're not fit to serve the living God. There is the millennium, praise God for that. Verse 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world, this world age is what it says, and the uh, deceitfulness of riches 
choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. I mean, it just, um, there is no way that trying to make it in this world, it comes first and he puts, puts the truth on the back burner. And it's one of the, you become unfruitful. Why? Because God's not going to bless you. You're not going to be successful in anything, not even in the ways of this world. You know, people that make it without God's blessings, there's nothing wrong with being rich with God's blessings. Okay. As a matter of fact, God promises it, that uh, uh, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, that the church of Smyrna, you are rich, rich in truth, and even with the blessings of God in, in the world. Why? When God blesses you, you can't go wrong. So therefore, um, never apologize for wealth gained righteously from Almighty God. But um, trying to make it the hard way, you're always going to look over your shoulder and wonder when are they going to catch you. They will. Okay? It's short-lived in that respect. So don't sow among the thorns, which is to say in a patch in this world where you're more concerned about what people might say or the deceitful uh, teachings of other people and so forth to let deception, which is Babel, draw you away from the true word of God, the true planting of God. Don't let that happen to you. Verse 23, But he that received seed unto the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. They, they, it all pays the same thing in God's eyes because uh, whatever God gives you, that he expects in return. And when, for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear, the truth of God's word is so very wonderful to, to you know, his method of teaching in this way that you have this laid out right in front of you of what to do with God's Word, how to, how to sow it. Don't expect 100% of every seed to, to fall on ears that are going to hear. It's not. But that one part that does makes it all worthwhile. That's the sowing the Master's Word, that that Word can change lives, can give hope, can bring happiness, and completeness. You see, knowing your destiny from the sower, the fact that you are loved of God, and from the teaching of the close of the last chapter, you're family. You're His family. And He loves you. And when you return that love, He's going to bless you. And He's going to help open your mind even more to his truth, whereby you can let your light shine brighter and plant more seeds with success. And how precious it is. And he would use this simple way of a man sowing seed, or a woman, to show you the very truth of God's word and what's going to happen to it when you sow it. He continues then in the next verse, in verse 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto, to, unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. And this is, this is put, taking this whole earth age now and, and uh, laying it out where you can understand it. It's, this is the parable, and it is a parable. It is the world, and a man sows good seed. Every one of them was a good seed. Verse 25, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now, who is this enemy, and what are tares? Uh, tares are, in actuality, are they would be called zawan. And when it's growing, take the wheat plant, the zawan looks exactly while they're growing as wheat. And you, can't, you can hardly tell the difference. 
So if you were to go in there to hoe out or plow out the Zawan, you're going to wreck a lot of wheat while you're at it because you can't tell the difference. So you have to let them grow. And, and when they come to maturity, the wheat, you have this rich golden grain that God uh, made from which comes bread and other things. But what comes from the Zawan, the one that the wicked one planted while others slept? That means while they were blindsided, deceived, these evil seeds were planted. The Zawan brings forth a black, bitter, poisonous grain. And it is poison. And so is false teaching. And naturally what this is leading up to is the fact that the man who sowed the good seed was Almighty God through the Son. The wicked seed was sown by Satan himself. That's what this parable will be leading up to. This is why I told you this is one of the most important parables and not everybody will be able to see it. They'll say, are you saying that the serpent sowed seed in this earth? Well, of course he did. God declares it. In, in um, Genesis, uh, the great book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, he says to the serpent, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. So naturally, then, oh, dear goodness, I, my preacher said never talk even about the serpent seed. Well, you'd better. That's what the parable is about. And if you're not blind, you'll be able to see it. So here, the word seed from here on becomes children. Okay. It's a little different word in the Greek language. And it means children. So that you don't have any problems understanding it. And, and so it is. W what has happened so forth? Well, here's the world. And we had two sores. You better be able to discern who they are. We'll learn in the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's Word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. And that number be 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular denomination, reverend, or organization. We, we don't judge people. We have a judge, it's our father. And he's, he does not need our help in judging. So uh, let your question be concerning the word or whatever God leads you to ask. Now, those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always so good to hear from you. Now, got a prayer request? You don't need that number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. You don't even have to say it out loud. Why? Because you're his child. And he wants you to love him. Return that love. He'll return yours, certainly. You'll be blessed. So... With that, let's go to his throne. Father, around the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to get right into it. We're going to go with, uh, let's see here. 
going to go with uh, Lynn from Arkansas. Please explain more in depth about figuring someone, forgiving rather, someone 490 times a day. If I have to forgive somebody that many times, it certainly seems to me that they have not had a change of heart and are certainly not sincere. Thank you. Well, it, it is true, but what what God what Christ wanted you to know is that's how much patience He has. That if you sin and repent, He's going to forgive you, 490 times. We all fall short, and certainly, but uh, on an individual basis, you're absolutely right. Um, if um, if somebody, if an individual offended you 490 times in a day, there's a, something bad wrong somewhere. Uh, an intelligent person would uh, naturally know, I don't need this. Okay, Elizabeth from Kentucky. Uh, could Let's see how this goes. Could you please make this clear how many persons were on the ark? My sister and I have had bad talks over Noah's Ark. My sister believes two persons of every race were on the Ark. I thought it was only um, Noah and his wife, three sons, and their wives. And, uh, and so which way is right? Well, have you ever read Genesis chapter 6? It is true in Genesis chapter 6 that Noah had the only perfect generation. That means, that's a pedigree, meaning they had not mixed with the fallen angels. They were the only Adamic people that still lived that had a perfect um, uh, pedigree fit for Christ to come through. And all others, um, had to be put away. Now, though as loading the ark in Genesis 6, God said take two of every flesh. Didn't say animals, didn't say monkeys, didn't say elephants. It says two of every flesh. All the races are flesh. There is no, uh, there is no uh, possibility for racial problems if everyone treats everyone with dignity and respect when they deserve it because God created all the races. He created them on the sixth day. He didn't create this Adamic family, Eth Ha'adam in the Hebrew manuscripts, until the eighth day. And there were only eight of them on board the ark, but there was two. Your sister is very correct, and but that's okay. Don't feel bad about it. Go back and read Genesis 6 and put it together in your mind whereby you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Uh, Sean from California, what is the significance in feeding the multitude? Also the significance of the five loaves and two fish. Well, it's that uh, Christ's word, Christ's love and his truth and his blessings, uh, he has enough for everybody, a multitude. And he is able to supernaturally uh, present that food to them. And of course, what the food is basically is the seed we planted today is truth. But the five loaves, five means that's the number for grace. That's God's love and his grace. And the fish is a cipher that means Jesus Christ um, um, savior of Israel. It is the cipher that always means Christian. And um, there is two, the Father and the Son. And where those two are always is the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, you might, when we come to the 16th chapter of Matthew, you'll learn a, a great lesson about that feeding of the multitude, about picking up fragments of all the people that were there. Some of it's not good. It's the doctrine of the traditions of men. We'll, we'll get to it in the 16th chapter of this great book of Matthew. George from Virginia, where did Christ go after he was crucified? Did he go to heaven or hell for three days? I was told he went to hell to save the people there. Uh, he, he went to paradise and he went to the opposite side, which is hell for a lot of people, okay? Was for the rich man. Um, 
but they are in holding until the millennium. And God is always fair. You see, had Christ, who was the Savior, he was God with us, his office as Savior, that was not presented to people who passed on before Christ's crucifixion. They died without ever having the opportunity to have forgiveness of sins and to repent. They had to go by the law, and that was very difficult for man to do. But he made it real easy for those that would believe. It wasn't easy for Christ. It cost him his life. But it makes it easier for you that on repentance, you have those sins forgiven. They're washed away. Well, it would have been very unfair for God not to have made that possible for all those that went on. So therefore, when you read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, you find out that he went to those in the wrong side of paradise that didn't make it all the way back to the time of Noah, which means the beginning, when, when many of them were done away with, who were hybrids from the fallen angels and gave them the opportunity to accept Christ. And if you read on in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, you find out that he freed many of those captives because they received him, that making God fair that he gave all those people the same right that you have today to repent and have your sins forgiven. Anytime that you feel God is unfair, you've made a mistake. He's always fair in everything if you'll come to understanding. Uh, Brenda from North Carolina, is it okay to say please to God? My church says it was not okay. I, I, don't, I do not like to judge another church, and, um, uh, but uh, I, cannot, uh, I cannot imagine why someone would say it's not okay to say please to God. Now, I, I, personally, I would rather say, if it be your will, Father, let it be. And um, I think you'll get a lot more results. But at the same time, he, he's very gentle. And it would not offend him. Now, what really offends me sometimes if people will say, you must, if you show lack of faith, then you don't order God to do it. I'm going to tell you something. These people that order God to do something better be very careful. Um, he, uh, he's our Father. And I don't think you will get very far trying to order Him to do something when you are very strictly ordered to ask if it be His will. So naturally, it's better to cut right to the chase and ask our Father if it's your why. He knows what's best for you. If you have the faith to trust Him and believe Him, you know that He wants the best for you and is going to have the best for you. Therefore, for whatever you want, ask Him if it's His will and to give it if it's His will. And if it isn't, don't give it. Because He's not going to anyway, but it clears you and lets Him know that you love Him and trust Him. Uh, Bernie from Florida, can you please tell me where in the Bible it says that the elect can minister to their loved ones in the millennium? Well, uh, let's, let's go to the book of Ezekiel. From chapter 40 to the end, it's all about the millennium. There is more written in the Old Testament in the book of Ezekiel about the millennium than there is in all the New Testament put together. And in the 44th chapter of uh, Ezekiel, which you're in the millennium then, so you have to go spiritually there. It states very clearly that if you are one of the Zadok, which is a Hebrew word that means the elect, the just, a priest of the Zadok, that's one of God's elect, then you are able to even visit with Christ during the millennium. Not everybody will be able to approach Him, but you will be able to, but at the same time, he states that a blood relative or someone, I suppose, that you really want to help, that you can go to them and witness to them, but you do pay a penalty. You have to cleanse yourself seven days before you can approach back to Christ. But well, what are you doing by doing that? Well, 
if they're still having problems in the millennium with the world and the ways and everything, that's pretty bad because they're in spiritual bodies. They've got no flesh hangups. And if they're not, and they're able to see Christ, they can't go to him, but they can see him. They know he's real and they know he cleansed the earth. Then they're in kind of hard straits, but you can go and talk to them. Discipline is the thing. Tell them to get their act together or you're going to burn. God is a consuming fire and, and you can help them in that way. But it will be seven days you will be cleansed before you can approach Christ again. And so it is. You can read it in Ezekiel 44, begin about verse 20. Zadok means the elect, the just. Uh, Sharon from Texas, please explain the word Septuagint. Septuagint, naturally, uh, and you asked the word be explained. Let me, so people will know what we're talking about. The Septuagint is an older translation of God's word than the King James. But the translation was from Hebrew language into the Greek language. And, and it is called the Septuagint because it is an older set of manuscripts. Sometimes it's a little bit to your advantage to go to the Septuagint and retranslate it back and then into your language to find out if there is something seems not quite right or something in the translation you have directly from the Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. But Septuagint is just a, word, a number, it's 72, because um, 72 people did it in 72 days. And so it's called 72. Uh, Maggie from California, is there anything wrong with thinking the Bible is with thinking the Bible is to me, about me, and for me. Well, if you're a child of God, it is about you. Uh, you I would not take any moments of grandeur. That could be certainly wrong. A lot of times, as a matter of fact, there's a scripture too that says, ye are gods. And some people just really get a lift there. They say, well, look at me, I, I'm a god. No, that's not what it means. The saying is, you belong to God. You are His. Therefore, you are God's meaning ownership, not that you are some kind of whiz, okay? Uh, so, um, but it is your family. And Christ made that very clear in today's lecture when He said, who is my br mother, brother, and sister, okay? It's those that do the will of God. Uh, Bernie from South Carolina, I was baptized many years ago in another church. If I switch my belief, do I need to be baptized again? Uh, Christ hasn't changed. And if you were baptized, you were baptized to, uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, baptism is between the individual and Christ, not some church, not some organization, though many of them put themselves in that position. If Christ accepts you, you don't have to be baptized again. Christ hasn't changed. Um, your beliefs might have changed, but still it was Christ you were baptized to. And um, again, he doesn't change. Our understanding of him can change. But um, yet it is a personal thing and you're the one that only you can decide that factor. Angela from Georgia. Where in the Bible does it say that Jesus was born on September the 25th or 29th? Well, if you um, are a student of the Word, you go to Luke chapter 1 and you find out um, on the course of Abiah, that's a date, okay? The course of Abiah is a date. And, and, um, and it lets you know the date that John the Baptist was conceived. And John the Baptist was six months older than Christ. Christ's conception took place six months later. Therefore, we know that the conception took place on December the 25th. So when did the Holy Spirit be 
began to dwell with us because when Mary on the day of conception approached her cousin Elizabeth, the Levit Levitical priestess, uh, married to a Levitic Levite priest, John leapt in her womb because of the presence. <clears throat> so naturally the birth was on September the 29th approximately, uh, or pretty well definitely, and um, the conception was December the 25th. So as a Christian, uh, not everybody's going to understand that. Um, if anyone really wants to make a more in-depth study of it, it's very simple if you know the courses and the course of Avaya specifically. But I have a tape titled uh, Christmas, I think, and uh, it, the, it goes into the fact of when Christ was born, scripturally. Uh, Wanda from North Carolina, I go to a church who says not to worry about the end times because we will be raptured. They did not make, that did not make sense to me. Why would God write us a love letter and then some say pay no attention to certain parts? My question, how can I not be fooled at the sixth trump? Well, apparently you're reading the New Testament or you wouldn't, I mean, the book of Revelation or you wouldn't know about the sixth trump. I, I never judge churches, all right? I don't want to, but the danger is that um, uh, at the sixth trump, the Antichrist is coming and um, you don't want to be fooled there because he's coming first. And I'm going to tell you a real easy way. It's an oversimplification because you should know from the scripture. But the oversimplification is to know when the seventh trump sounds and the true Christ returns, instantly, the wink of an eye, we're changed into spiritual bodies. So as long as you can pinch yourself and you're in the flesh, true Christ is not here. He's not with us, but the Antichrist is. And his message is most likely, I'm gonna rapture you out of here. Bring all your kin folks that don't believe on me and let's convert them. And that's why people will betray their own people because they'll think it's Jesus and they're trying to save their souls, but they're trying to destroy them by um, leading them to Antichrist. Don't go there. That's an oversimplification, but it'll help you. Okay, uh, Cynthia from uh, Florida. I was in church and the pastor mentioned that 10 nations joined together and America was not included. He talked as though it was a bad thing that America was not included. That was only my second time going to that church. I believe he was speaking about a chapter in Revelation. Will it or not be bad or a good thing? Thank you for your comments on this subject. Well, those 10 nations joined together and the Euro dollar came into being. Well, now let's see. Out of that group of nations, look at Greece, what has happened there. You might look at Spain. You might look at Italy. Uh, we've kind of got problems, but they're going belly up, okay? As a matter of fact, Greece is all but withdrawing herself from the euro dollar and printing her own money again. No, it's not something we wanted any part of. And um, a, per a person would not be a very good scholar of the word to think that we were. The one world system will come into being, but the euro uh, organization is not it. Uh, okay, Daniel from, Daniel and Joyce, and I don't know where they're from. Well, here, we, let's go. We, we love your program, okay? I'm a disabled vet and my wife is on Social Security SSD and we cannot spend what is left. It's not much, but we sometimes live on less. Uh, will all the spirits from the first earth age go through the second before the seventh trump? All except the archangels and cherubims. They will never be born to woman and uh, they're pretty well named. Um, even God himself was born of woman in the form of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. 
but um, it is true. And when you're when you're disabled and on a fixed income, uh, you don't worry about your offerings. Okay, you just uh, do what you have to do to to survive in these times. My name is Kim from Virginia. My question for you is: When God is calling His people to come out of Babylon, the Babylonian system, is He referring to the members who are in the denominational churches? Well, He's 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 talking about people that are deceived. It's deception. Babel is just that. It's false teaching. Babylon, God is not the author of confusion, that's Babylon, but of peace. So naturally, it goes into the main thing. The first beast in the great book of Revelation is a political system, okay? Not, not a religious system. The religious system doesn't kick in until chapter 11, verse 11, rather, of chapter 13 of the great book of Revelation, and that's where the danger comes in. Okay, that's the false one. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes His day when you get the letter that He's written for you to absorb. It just really does make his day, and when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. And um, he, he created you for his pleasure, and loving him does give that pleasure. We, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we have helped you. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, I'll tell you what, you listen to me and listen real good. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yahshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.